Well, good morning, and I hope and trust that all of you are doing well and, and staying healthy and, and uh, finding some blessings to enjoy uh, along the way um, because they're certainly out there, and, and it's, it's being able to be together this way is one of them, and I'm so grateful we can still worship together as a church family, albeit a different way. Several years ago, uh, my family was vacationing in Florida, and while we were there, I was in a bookstore, and I know that's nerdy to be at the beach when you go to the bookstore, but that's the way I roll, and, and I picked up an audio book, and I, I wanted to listen to that on the way back. You can put your earbuds in, usually everybody else is sleeping anyway, and it, it makes the drive go quicker if you have something good to listen to, and this was a good book. The name of the book was called The Circle Maker uh, by Mark Batterson. Um, it's a book about prayer that I found to be very motivational as well as informative, and there's some good principles about prayer in there. But in the book, uh, Batterson tells about a Jewish scholar from the first century B.C., and his name, I'm probably not going to say this right, but it's Honi Magel. Uh, he's not mentioned in the Bible, so this is not a, a biblical person that we read about, but the Jewish Talmud describes him as a great man of faith who saw miracles happen in response to his faith-filled prayers. His story goes like this. Uh, in Israel, a winter is typically the season where they get most of their rain. But this particular year, it didn't rain well into the winter, and they were in a drought situation. And we think of winter was not farming going on, but that is actually a, a farming season, I understand, for them. So they were in desperate need of rain, or the crops were going to fail, and they were going to be in dire situation. So Honey, it, it's recorded, uh, drew a circle around himself on the ground, and he told God that he wasn't going to leave that circle until God sent rain. Now that's... That's boldness in prayer. And when it began to drizzle, Honey uh, said, that's not the, the rain that I'm praying for. Uh, and he continued to pray that God would send rain. And then it picked up and it began to pour. And, and uh, believe it or not, Honey actually said, that's not the rain that I'm praying for either because if it comes too, too fast, uh, instead of soaking into the ground, it'll run off or it'll wash away the, the topsoil. We, we don't need that. And he said, I pray for a steady rain, a soaking rain that will soak into the ground. And friends, that's eventually what he got. Now, I hear a story like that, and I, I wonder, uh, how did old Honey have that kind of faith to pray so specifically and with such determination that he wasn't going to leave that circle until God uh, heard his prayer uh, to draw a circle around himself and say, I'm not leaving, God, until I see you move. And then to hold out, kind of like in the spirit of Goldilocks, not too little, not too much, but just the right amount of rain and just the right intensity of rain how can you be so bold, so specific uh, in your prayer life? According to some reading that I did about this guy that fascinated me, uh, beyond the book, I kind of did a little internet research myself, there was some talk of excommunicating him because it was felt that he had dishonored God uh, with his demands. And it does kind of seem a little disrespectful to say, God, I'm going to draw this circle and I'm not leaving until you do what I'm asking you to do. And I can see how that would come across as being pushy uh, or demanding. But it was said, what I, from what I read, he was excused because it was noted that he had a special relationship with God. Guys, that's one of my goals of my life is that it could be said of me, he was bold in prayer because he had a special relationship with God. Uh, he, he, he had an intimate walk with God where he, he uh, trusted in him completely, and when God was speaking to him to move, he moved. And when God was speaking to him to be still, he was still. Wouldn't we all hope for that? Let me begin, before we get into this topic, I bet some of you thought we were going a certain direction because of the title of the message today, which is Praying in the Spirit. And let me address kind of the elephant in the room, if you will, when it comes to this topic of praying in the Spirit. Within Christianity, there is disagreement between believers that maybe come from a more uh, charismatic background and those that come from a more 
traditional, we'll call it, uh, background uh, over what this means to pray in the Spirit. And most that come from a charismatic background would likely say that praying in the Spirit, it means that you're praying in tongues. And they believe that you're praying when you're praying in the Spirit, that the Holy Spirit takes over and causes you to speak in a, a heavenly language that only God understands, but men often don't unless there's someone that's given the gift of interpretation. Now, one of the passages that's often used to support this belief is this in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in his spirit. Now, this verse does seem to indicate that Paul views tongues as a way of speaking to God. And sometimes praying in tongues is referred to uh, by those from a, a charismatic background as their prayer language. They'll, they'll refer to it that way. Well, further on in chapter 14 of, of 1 Corinthians, Paul adds this. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So the belief is that when you're praying in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit takes over, so to speak, and overrides your mind, and he begins doing the praying. He begins guiding and directing uh, the prayer. Speaking in tongues is a, a hot-button issue uh, among many Christians. People on both sides of this issue have strong opinions, and, and uh, you know, anytime you talk about this, somebody's going to get upset with what you say about this. Let me just say, this is not an issue that I am dogmatic about. Uh, some see this as a salvation issue, that if you believe in tongues, then, then you are not right with the Lord. If you don't believe in tongues, that you're not right with the Lord, you're, you might not even be saved. Uh, I don't feel the need to come down on this issue one way or the other. Personally, I don't speak in tongues, I don't pray in tongues, but neither do I condemn those who say that that is a part of, of their relationship with the Lord. It's clear that speaking and praying in tongues was a part of the early church as recorded in the book of Acts. I mean, uh, there's, there's no denying that. What Christians disagree over, though, is whether it's a gift that is continued to today. There are some that will say, well, that was a, a gift, that was God's way of authenticating who his true messengers were, who truly spoke for him. Uh, they didn't have the New Testament in the days of the early church. It was being written uh, at that time, or it was, being, it was happening what would later be recorded. And so anybody could claim to have a word from God, but many times as we see in the Old Testament and the New, God would authenticate who his true prophets or his messengers were by giving them supernatural signs and wonders of the gift of prophecy and, and so forth to authenticate who truly spoke for him. So some will say now that we have the Old and the New Testament and in Revelation it says there's not to be a word added or taken away from this book. It's now complete. Um, they're saying we no longer need these miraculous gifts like tongues and that they have been ceased. That they have ceased since that time. Others say, well, the Bible never says that they cease, and so what, who are we to say that there's not the gift of tongues still today? So uh, because of that, I can see both sides of that argument. Speaking in tongues, uh, I will say this, is not a part of our corporate worship experience here at the Carpenters Christian Church. And here's the, the big reason why. Paul also says that while it's fine to speak in tongues to edify yourself, it's better, he says, to speak in words that can benefit other believers. In, in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 19, he says, Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. So we're determined uh, in our church not to let this issue be something that's divisive. Uh, and so just when we come together to worship, it's not a part of our corporate practice. And so whatever you believe about the matter, um, we ask you just to keep that in your private relationship uh, with God. And, uh, and, and so with that said, let me set aside that uh, view of praying in the Spirit uh, today. And I want to look at it from another angle that I think has broader uh, ramifications for us today. Last week, if you'll let me review for just a moment, we talked about the importance of faith uh, when we pray. And I talked with you about how uh, faith comes from the Word of God. And if you want to know what to pray and how to pray confidently, go to the Word, and the Word will tell you the will of God and how to pray the will of God. In Romans 10, 17, it says, so faith comes from hearing, and hearing 
comes from the word of Christ. And so as we get into the word, it guides us and tells us how to pray confidently. And aligning our prayers with the word of God to ensure that we are praying the will of God. So if you want to be a prayer warrior, you also need to be a student of the word. And to get into the word and to see what it says about the topics that, that you're going through, that you're dealing with in your, in your life so you know how to pray. The second key to effective prayer we learned last week is to come to him with clean hands. And we spent the bulk of our time talking about that. And it represents a repentant heart. None of us, starting with this guy, are perfect. We all struggle and we need God's grace. But the attitude of our heart is repentant, meaning that we, we don't want to sin anymore. And when we do, it bothers us like it bothers God. And we are wanting to stand right before God, uh, constantly needing the grace and the blood of Jesus, but our desire is to obey him. That is an important principle in prayer. And I want to revisit a scripture that I shared with you uh, last week, if I can. In 1 John chapter 3. He says, beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, meaning we have clean hands, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. So the second principle, in addition to having faith that comes from the word of God, is also knowing that we are, to the best of our ability, applying that to our own life. And we have clean hands as we stand before God. Well, what I want you to see this morning, and the reason I mention those two things in review again today, is that as we think about the Holy Spirit and praying in the Spirit, church, I want you to understand that the Holy Spirit is the key to making those first two things happen. Okay, It is the Holy Spirit that opens our eyes and gives us insight and understanding as we read the Word and helps us apply that Word to our life. It's the Holy Spirit that does this. Uh, he produces the fruit in us. We call them the fruit of the Spirit. He makes us more loving, more joyful. He gives us more peace. He makes us more patient and kind and faithful and have more self-control and right on down the list. That is a work of the Holy Spirit that helps us have clean hands as we apply the Word of God to our life. Can I share with you one of the things that I am am learning, and I say learning because I'm not finished learning this lesson yet, but one of the things that I've most recently learned about life in the Spirit. I was raised in, in the church and ha have known God since I was a small child. I can't really tell you from my past the time when I wasn't in church. My earliest memories are, are being in the church, and I'm thankful to my parents for that. And anyone who's watching, um, I just want to take a moment to tell you the importance the importance for everyone to be in church, but especially if you have children, give them that foundation. I know we can't physically be in the church right now, but when we're able to come back together again, please make it a priority to give them the foundation because if you don't let the word of God train your children, uh, the world will train them. And so we need to counter that by keeping them grounded in the truth and around people that are also committed to living that life. That soapbox sermon aside, let me get back to what I was saying. I was baptized when I was 10 years old and probably really looking back was ready to make a decision for Christ before that. Uh, but for many of those years, if I'm honest, I only had a limited understanding of, of the role the Holy Spirit played in my life as a believer. I don't know why that was. I, maybe, maybe the church background I had, we didn't talk about the Holy Spirit a lot. I mean, I knew he was the third person of, of the Trinity, and, and I knew some theological things about him. But as far as the experience of living with the Holy Spirit every day, I didn't know a lot about that. And because I was raised in the church and influenced by godly parents, I've long known that it's important to obey God and to, to strive to live a godly life. But like most people, I had areas of my life where... I was more prone to give in to temptation than others. Some of the areas, no problem. It's easy to obey that. But there were certain areas in my life where it was a struggle, and I was prone to give in from time to time. And I had a repentant heart. I, I think back about it. I, I, I believe I had a repentant heart because I felt convicted when I did these things. There was the, the spirit inside of me that said, this is not right. I wanted to change. I wanted to overcome these areas of weakness. But I struggled with these same issues week after week. 
and, and uh, you know, would come to God in prayer and, and say, God, you know, it's me again, same deal, you know, that we talked about before. And, and I just felt like a, a hypocrite so many times. But I felt like maybe I was phony because here I am talking about these same things and I'm not getting any victory over this. And so um, maybe you feel that way too. I just feel like maybe this is a word that my experience parallels your experience and you feel this way too. I know that I could identify with the Apostle Paul who said in Romans chapter 7 verse 15, for I don't understand my own actions, he said, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. And then he goes on in verses 17 through 18, so now it is no longer I who do it, but it's sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. Watch this. For I have the desire to do what is right. Oh, that was me, but not the ability to carry it out. Friend, can you identify with that too today? Now, don't miss the significance of that last part of verse 18 because the, the truth of that simple statement took me years to figure out myself. I had good intentions. And I believe a lot of us have good intentions or you probably wouldn't be watching this broadcast today. But I found I didn't have the ability to carry it out. And so for years, I was trying to be a better Christian through self-improvement by just bearing down and, and trying harder. And God, I'll do better this week. Just watch me and I'll, I'm, I'm going to overcome that. And I kept failing over and over again. Until one day in just a, an honest moment of clarity, I just said to God, God, you know what I figured out? I can't do it. I can't do this. And, and then I, I prayed one of the most simple but maybe one of the most powerful prayers in my life. And I just said, God, I can't do it. Will you do it? Will you change me? Will you change me for me? And that sounds like such a, a simple request, but guys, it's had a profound effect upon my life. Now, don't misunderstand me. I still don't have it all together. I will be a work in progress until the day he calls me home. All of us will. So please don't think I am saying I have now reached some kind of level of enlightenment because I haven't. Um, but, but I have finally invited the Holy Spirit to come be an active change agent in my life and to help me with the parts of my life that I have proven again and again I can't control, that I have no, no power over. And Paul then goes on to explain after ex describing the predicament that he's in that I want to do these things and then I end up not doing them and I don't want to do these things and there I go again doing these things. After saying that, he goes on in the next chapter and remember the Bible didn't come divided into chapters so he's continuing the thought, right? In chapter 8, verses 13 through 14, for if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. You just keep trying to do this in your own power alone, you're not going to make it. But if by the Spirit... By the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. That is the mark of a believer that we are led by the Spirit of God. I finally realized it's not my job to change every facet about myself. I can only do so much. I need the Spirit of God. And you know what? I think God likes it that way. He doesn't want us to be totally independent of him, but to always maintain a healthy, humble dependence upon him to do what only he can do. Understand this, church. The Holy Spirit is the engine that drives the Christian life. I understand that more today than I, I did years ago. He, he's the one who guides and empowers us to do what we cannot do on our own. You will always be dependent upon the Holy Spirit, whether you realize it or not. He is our partner in prayer. And I, I, that's why I wanted to talk about this today. If we try to pray and we leave out the element of the Holy Spirit, we're missing the boat today. Our job in this is to yield to him. Now, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He's not going to force himself into your life. He's that still, small voice that's always standing in the background waiting for you to invite him in to your prayers, to your decisions, to your priorities, to your daily life. He's waiting for you to listen to his still, small voice. So I want to talk for a moment about being filled with the Spirit. 
I believe the Bible teaches that every believer in Jesus Christ has the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 1, it's one of the verses that tells us this, verse 13, and when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, which he promised long ago. So when you place your faith in Christ, I believe you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And, but I often think of that initial gift of the Spirit uh, kind of like a seed that is placed in your life. Now, different things can happen to a seed. We know that from the parable of the sower, don't we? But God explains what it means, and he tells us, I want you to not just have the Holy Spirit, but to be filled with the Spirit. In Ephesians 5.18, it simply says, be filled with the Spirit. Now, the Greek tense in this verse implies, not only is it a one-time event, but it implies that I want you to continually be filled with the Spirit. It's kind of like carrying water in a bucket that has a hole in it. You better keep filling it up or you're eventually going to run out of water. And so we are continually seeking this filling from the Holy Spirit. It's not a one-time experience, but it is a way of living. It's a posture before the Lord that we live with this desire to be filled continually. God becomes more than just a, a Sunday morning thought. I, I'm so glad that you're tuned in with us today, and, and this is a great time to come and edify one another and to worship the Lord together. But really, the, the crux of what happens in our life happens Monday through Saturday to show whether this is real or not, doesn't it? When the Holy Spirit becomes a part of your Monday through your Saturday, your thinking, your priorities, your words, your, your actions, then that, that is important, guys. He permeates our attitudes and our, our decisions. The Bible refers to this as keeping in step with the Spirit. In Ephesians 5.25, he says, If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Now, as I said, every believer has the Holy Spirit within them, but I believe that the Scripture says that not every believer is necessarily filled with the Spirit. Not every believer is necessarily walking in step with the Spirit's leading in their life. And it's not a matter of how much of the Holy Spirit you have. It's not like uh, you're going to listen to this message and you're going to get more of the Holy Spirit in your life. It's not how much of the Holy Spirit you have. Listen, church, it's how much of you the Holy Spirit has. And that is a conscious decision that we make in our life to say, God, I want to fully yield myself to the leading of your Holy Spirit. To pray and say, will you fill me with your Holy Spirit? One of the metaphors that, that the Bible uses to describe the Holy Spirit, it uses several, but one of them is that of, of the wind. And the wind uh, can blow any direction it wants, but the Holy Spirit as the wind uh, of God always blows. Listen, church, the Holy Spirit always blows in the direction of the will of God. He never blows in a different direction. We as believers are, I think if we continue this metaphor, we're kind of like sailors out on an open sea. And we're in a boat. And, and listen, to continue that analogy, for years in my life, I wanted to pursue God, but I was in a rowboat with the oars just rowing away, doing the best I could to reach God in my own strength through, through being religious, through being a rule follower, through, through doing the best I could in my strength to be a good person. And I made little progress. Some days I'd, I'd, I'd make some progress and I might really get closer to God in my strength. But then the currents of the, of the ocean, which I kind of take to represent the, the flesh, sometimes that current would pull me off course. And I'll be like the Apostle Paul says, I didn't mean to be over here, but here I am again. And maybe that's, you find that true in your life. But listen, when I finally invited God to come and take control and to fill me with his spirit, he became the captain of the ship. He got on board with me, and guys, that makes all the difference. Because what did he do in my life? When I invited him on board, he started to, he put this thing up, and it's just like this big sheet, and we call it a sail. And I was like, whoa, what's that? And, and, and to continue the metaphor, it's like he said, you watch what happens now. We're going to catch the wind. And so the wind of the Holy Spirit always blows in the direction of the will of God. And when I allow the Holy Spirit to adjust the sails of my life, then all of a sudden, I didn't have to row as hard anymore. And the, the power of the Holy Spirit started doing this. And my job was just to say, yes, Lord. Whenever he told me to turn it this way a little bit, I would adjust the sail. And then the power of the Holy Spirit would move me forward in my faith. 
And when we learn to pray in the Spirit, we're like the wise sailor that says, Holy Spirit, will you come aboard? Will you adjust the sails of my life so that I am in alignment with your will? Will you teach me to pray? Will you show me what to pray for? And he will adjust the sails so that you harness not just your power, but the power of the will of God. And he will keep you moving in the direction of the will of God. Friends, when you allow God to fill you with the Holy Spirit, you will begin to see the world from a different perspective. When the things of this world that used to have so much of a hold on your life, the things of this world that, that you used to think were so important, I bet you if we were here together and I could ask for a show of hands, how many of you today have different priorities than you did 20 years ago? I bet a lot of hands would go up around this place. And hopefully part of that is your maturity as a Christian, that now the Spirit has changed your priorities. Different things matter to you, materialism and, and wealth and all those things. There's nothing inherently evil about it. But if that's your main priority of your life, you need to grow in your relationship with God. He will impart his vision, his gifts, his power, and you'll find yourself, if you let him adjust the sails of your life, you'll find yourself doing things you never dreamed you would do. You'll find yourself doing things you never dreamed you could do if you allow him to come on board and adjust the sails of your life. Friends, when you pray in the Spirit, it means that the Holy Spirit has your mind and your heart so in tune with the will of God that it's as if you are praying and thinking and saying the very words of God himself. Romans 8, 27 says, And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. As we said at the beginning of this series on prayer, prayer is not about us getting God to do what we want. That would be dangerous. I don't want God to do everything I want. But I want God to teach me what he wants so I can get an agreement with him because that's the best plan anyway. And that's the plan to effective prayer. You'll pray better, more effective prayers because you, began, uh, you begin praying not just from your mind, your thoughts, your opinions, but with the mind of God. The mind of God. You desire the things that God desires instead of the lusts of the flesh, instead of the things that your simple mind can come up with. Galatians 5.16 says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not desire or gratify the desires of the flesh. One of the greatest ways to overcome temptation is not to try to, to do it in your own power, but just to allow the Holy Spirit to come in and flood you so much there's no room for that stuff anymore. He just overwhelms you with the righteousness of God. The Spirit opens our eyes and gives us insight into the mindset of God. I want to share a passage. It, it's more lengthy than what I normally share, so stay with me. But it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and I think it speaks so directly to what we're talking about this morning. I'm starting in verse 10. But it was to us that God revealed these things by his Spirit. For his Spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. That fascinates me. No one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. And we have received God's spirit, not the world's spirit, so that we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. When we tell you these things, we do not use words that come from human wisdom. Instead, we speak words given to us by the Spirit. And the things that have been recorded in the Bible, those weren't just the Apostle Paul's thoughts or Moses' thoughts. If we're back in the Old Testament or any prophet, they were inspired by the Word of God. And everything that's recorded for us are the very thoughts of God as these men were led to record them. Using the Spirit's words to explain spiritual truths. But people, watch this. People who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's Spirit. It all sounds foolish to them, and they can't understand it. For only those who are spiritual can understand what the Spirit means. Those who are spiritual can evaluate all things, but they themselves cannot be evaluated by others. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to teach Him? But then this last thing, watch this, church. But we understand these things, for we have the mind of Christ. Now, that sounds braggadocious to say that we have the mind of Christ. But, friends, doctrinally, that's true. The Holy Spirit, the presence of God living in us, 
it's as if you sit down to pray, and wouldn't it be a, 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 a tremendous blessing to have Jesus sit right beside you and go, hey, will you tell me what to say when I pray? And Jesus just step by step telling you everything to say. That would be wonderful. But here's, here's the news flash. That's what you have through the Holy Spirit. The mind of God alive in you, and when you tap into the Spirit of God, you pray the will of God. Friends, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you are praying and you learn to pray in the Spirit. You're praying not just with your intellect, with your best thoughts, but the Spirit imparts to us the mind of Christ so that we can pray in harmony with what Jesus would pray. And we're going to pray powerful prayers when we pray in the Spirit. Sometimes you'll, you'll hear people say, well, God told me this. Right? And I'm sure you've heard people say that. And maybe you know people that are always saying that. Well, God told me this morning or, you know, last night before I went to bed, God said this to me. And I've got to admit, if I'm honest, I'm always kind of a little skeptical when people say that a lot. Because I'm like, you're hearing a lot more than I am, you know. And maybe they are. Maybe they are. But I think sometimes we can be guilty of taking our thoughts and putting God's quotation marks around them. And then who's going to question that, right? So we've got to be careful. When we say, God told me, and if the word of God says it, we already know God said that, right? And God tells me things from his word all the time. Don't, don't misunderstand that. But I do believe that the Spirit does impress things upon our mind and our heart. Isaiah chapter 30, there's an interesting verse, verse 21. He says, your own ears will hear him. Right behind you a voice will say, this is the way you should go, whether to the right or to the left. And I believe that the Spirit is the presence of God with us each day. I don't just believe it. The Bible tells us that. And, and that he is guiding us. If we'll listen for his still, small voice, he wants to be a part of our decisions. He wants to help us filter our words and what we say and what we don't say. Now, sometimes my mouth engages before I listen to the Spirit and I get myself in trouble. But if I can pause and listen, he'll keep me out of a lot of trouble. Guys, we should never be haphazard about using that phrase, God told me. Be careful when you use that. But I do believe that we as spirit-filled believers can hear the spirit share with us the mind of God. You know, if we, as we look in scripture, the spirit alerted Ananias to pray for Saul in Acts chapter 9. The Spirit prompted Philip to go over to a random chariot and said, strike up a conversation with that guy. He's about, he's about to receive the Lord if somebody would just come alongside of him. And so led by the Spirit, he went over and he began this conversation. And sure enough, the, the Ethiopian man accepted the Lord and he baptized him that day. Perhaps, perhaps it was the Holy Spirit that told our friend Honey at the beginning of the message today. Maybe that was why he was bold enough to draw a circle because the Spirit told him to. And he said, I'm going to stand here, God, until we all see the answer to your prayer come. He may be a, the Spirit may be putting somebody on your heart right now that needs to know the Lord. And there needs to be a conversation that takes place with this loved one, a friend, a coworker, or somebody. And you've been carrying this burden. And maybe it's because the Spirit is tapping you on the shoulder and going, I need you right here. I need you to be my mouthpiece. I need you to be my instrument to, to share the gospel with this person. Or maybe he's putting somebody on your heart that is alone and in and, and need right now, and it's the Spirit that's tapping you on the shoulder and saying, I need you to go and do this for them. I need you to go meet a need in their life. I need you to call them up and encourage them or just to, to check on them. Friends, be sensitive to that voice of the Spirit speaking into our life. But one thing I'll tell you that he will never tell you to do is something that contradicts the Word of God. So be careful. Not every thought we have is from the Lord. Hold it all up to the Word of God, but listen for His still, small voice. Friends, as I close this morning, I just want to ask you a few questions for us to reflect upon today, and then I'm going to pray for us. Number one, have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ? Have you received the gift of the Holy Spirit? Uh, not everyone has the Spirit unless we pray and receive Jesus Christ. And when we receive him as our Savior, the Bible says when we repent and are baptized, he will give us the gift of the Holy Spirit. Secondly, if you're a believer and you have the Holy Spirit, is he leading? Have you asked him to fill you with his Spirit? Not just to have it present inside of you, but are you open to say, come and take control? Whatever you say to me, Lord, the answer is yes. 
And, and have you given him complete control of your life? If not, you can take an important step today, the step that I took that has made a huge difference in my life and saying, I can't fix these areas of my life. I've proven that. Will you come in and take control? Will you change me, God, and fill me with your spirit? Thirdly, are you trying to live the, the Christian life in your own power? Are you walking in step with the spirit? Let me tell you this. The Holy Spirit of God is talking to us every day. How often we miss it. How often we ignore it. Or how often we're just so busy and focused on other things. I wonder how many really important eternal things I've missed because I was too busy with other plans. Fourthly, are you praying according to what you think is best? Or when you pray, are you praying in the Spirit? Are you praying the mind of Christ and tapping in to what he says through his word, but also that still small voice of the Spirit that guides us and quickens that word for just the right time, just the right moment in your life? Let me pray for you, friend. God, I... I thank you today for this wonderful, wonderful gift. As we talked about last week, to be able to come into the Holy of Holies and speak with the Lord of the universe, I, I can't get my mind around this privilege that we have. Forgive us for not taking advantage of that more often. God, I, it's a humbling thing to come into the presence of Almighty God. And I know that in the grand scheme of things, I am nobody to stand before the Lord of the universe. But Father, your word tells me that because of Jesus... I have worth. Because of Jesus, I am righteous. Because of Jesus, I have access to you, and I can call you Father. And because of your Holy Spirit in my life, God, I can begin to think your thoughts. I can begin to become a part of your plan, your story, your kingdom, and I can be an instrument used for your glory. God, I pray that if there's anybody watching today or listening by radio that has been using their life to live for their glory for, and just seeking pleasures of this world and, and, and fleeting things that don't last, God, I pray that your spirit will show them I have something more important for your life. I want you to be a part of my kingdom story. I want you to live not just for a few fleeting years here on this earth, but I want you to live and reign with me forever. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone that needs to receive Jesus, that today, they're not going to wait till we get back in the church houses. This is just a building. Today, the church is gathered in a different way, but we're gathered, and you are alive and well just as, as always, and you always will be. I pray that today would be a day of salvation for someone. That they say, yes, I need the Spirit of God in my life. I'm tired of living on my own power, my own strength. I need you not just in eternity. I need you right now in my life. And through prayer, we can have fellowship with you. Even if we can't have fellowship with others, God, there's never been a more important time for prayer than right now during this time of isolation. We can have the greatest fellowship that there ever was through prayer. God, would you come in to someone's life today? Lord, maybe there's someone who has the seed of the Spirit in their life, but God, you want to do so much more. You want to be so much more in their life. You're just waiting to be invited. Come and fill me with your Spirit, God. I pray that you'll give them the courage to take those steps today to say, God, I want you to come and have your complete way in my life. To do the things that I've proven time and again I can't do in my own strength. Would you change me, God? Would you come in and, and, and set the sails of my life so that I can learn what it's like to live with the current of your will and to know that I'm headed in the right direction? God, do that for somebody today, I pray. Lord, we, we trust you in all things. We need you every hour of every day. It's in Jesus' name we pray.